You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast featuring some of Indiana's most fascinating men and women whose impact has shaped our state, our communities, and us. Join us as we discuss their imprint on our history. Leaders and Legends is brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated, your local veteran business enterprise specializing in public relations, media relations, public outreach, crisis communications, and digital photography. My name is Robert Bain, Principal of Veteran Strategies, former Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Greg Ballard, and Communications Director for the Indiana Republican Party. I'm honored to be your host for our discussion. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel, Grand Hall, and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Thank you for joining us on the Leaders and Legends podcast. It's a special podcast. Our guest today is Tony Mason, CEO of Indianapolis Urban League. He has been involved in so many things, we can't even begin to talk about all of them. He is a proud Miami of Ohio grad, like my friend Derek Ruddleman, if you happen to be listening, and other (laughs) folks. Uh, He's on with us today to talk about Indianapolis, the conversation, the broader conversation we're having at the moment. The co-host today is Brian Payne, former Leaders and Legends podcast guest a living legend, according to the Indiana Historical Society, and a good friend. And we're going to turn the podcast over to him to start the conversation with Tony. But before we do that, I'd like to have a quick moment of silence. We lost someone, Marion County Constable, former Center Township Constable, excuse me, Tony Duncan. He was a good man. Uh, He let me know where he stood many times with a smile on his face, as I told my buddy Joel Miller. Uh, Tony was the best smack talker in Indiana politics, and every conversation I had with him started with, hey, Vane, come here, and I'm pretty sure I obeyed him every single time, but he did it all with a smile on his face, and he was a mentor to many, many people. So for just a few seconds, we're going to fall silent in his memory. Brian? Thanks, Robert. It's a great pleasure to be with you again, and I'm honored to be the uh, co-host of of this session with um, Tony Mason, who, uh, through his leadership, uh, he personally and the Indianapolis Urban League have become very important uh, friends, uh, partners, colleagues to uh, me personally and to Central Indiana Community Foundation. So, Tony, thanks for making the time in a moment in which uh, your leadership is more important than ever. And, and I know uh, you're as busy or busier than you've ever been. So thanks for carving out some time with us today. Brian and Robert, thank you both for having me. Yeah, so mm-hmm. thank you. First of all, you know, the Indianapolis Urban League is, um, you know, this has kind of this storied history, both, well, the Urban League nationally and uh, Indianapolis Urban League locally. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the Urban League, um, how long it's been around, and sure. uh, and uh, the mission, and kind of how we got how the Urban League got to this moment. Sure. Well, the Indianapolis Urban League was founded here in 1965, and uh, we had a number of great leaders here, like Attorney Henry Richardson, Dr. Tom Benford, Faye Williams, and a number of others who played a role in in bringing the affiliate here. And so I I am essentially the third president and CEO of the organization, the first being the late, great Sam Jones, and then my predecessor, Mr. Joe Slash, who is our city's first African-American deputy mayor. And so our mission here is to assist African-Americans, other minorities, and disadvantaged individuals with achieving economic and social equality. And uh, we do that through programming and services that we deliver on a daily basis with support from CICF and numerous funders in the community uh, with an emphasis on workforce development, education, health and wellness, family, family assistance, which includes emergency rent and utility services and supports, if you will, 
And then we also advocate on a number of issues. We are one of 95 Urban League affiliates nationwide. And, uh, and so we're part of this larger movement, if you will. And the National Urban League itself was founded in 1910 by Ruth Standish Baldwin and Dr. George Edmund Haynes. It took on the name of the National Urban League in 19, I'm sorry, in 1920. And so the idea was to help blacks or African-Americans, many who were migrating from the South to urban centers all across the country. And so the Urban League historically has played a role in, in helping blacks and African-Americans and others to achieve self-sufficiency through a number of means. Oftentimes, people, when they think of the National Urban League or they think of the Indianapolis Urban League, they only think of advocacy and not necessarily all of the things that we do each and every day uh, to help people in this community. Was Indianapolis kind of a, a late comer on the National Urban League scene? I mean, I know we had the great migration of African-Americans into, you know, Indianapolis, you know, well before 1965. Do you know anything yeah. about why we were late as a city and getting a, uh, a, a chapter? Well, I, I think Indianapolis is, has always somewhat moved at its, at its own pace. And typically when we're ready to do things here, you know, we do it, we do it in, in a big way. And, and I'm sure there had to be some connections to timing around supports across the broader community, if you will. So I would say that the, the African-American community would have felt that it should have been here much sooner. But as you know, we, we negotiate things here and, and in due time, we're able to get broad civic engagement and support. And, uh, you know, you can't underestimate the importance of the role of someone like Dr. Tom Benford in that process. Right. And also yes. 1965. Yes. As the civil rights movement was in its, uh, you know, its peak moments. Yes. Probably was a part of the final catalyst to get that mm -hmm. done. Absolutely. Tony, I first uh, met you when you were, uh, you know, working on major sporting events. Um, yes. So why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your uh, personal and professional journey into this uh, important leadership position? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for many people in the community, uh, some are aware of, of my involvement with Circle City Classic and also with the 2012 Indianapolis Super Bowl host committee. I had the good fortune of being the executive director of Circle City Classic for eight years. And so I, you know, remember those as great times and a lot of uh, wonderful football games, parades and things that ultimately uh, really was about raising funds to support the Indiana Black Expo Circle City Classic scholarship program. And so we were able to award millions of dollars through that. And then the economic impact to the city of Indianapolis was major as well at that time, as we typically average anywhere in the area of 45 to 50,000 fans per game. Uh, the Super Bowl uh, experience was a dream come true because I could have never imagined that I would be a part of the team and staff that would play a role in administering a Super Bowl in, in our city. I mean, I grew up in the Chicago area, so I get to tease my friends about the fact that Indianapolis actually beat Chicago to doing something <laughs> uh, on such a grand scale. Uh, but early in my career, I actually came out of recreational sports and out of the college and university setting. And so what essentially led me here, uh, my alma mater is Miami of Ohio. I was serving as assistant director of, of recreational sports on campus there. And then my wife and I, we were expecting our first child. And what was unique about our situation was that we were living in Newcastle, Indiana. And so I was commuting to Ohio. She was commuting here to Indy where she worked at Eli Lilly and co as a microbiologist. And so, um, I had gotten used to for two years living on central standard time and working Eastern standard time. And I said, this is not going to work with a baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, because I'm the one who typically can, I can survive on three or four hours of sleep at night. Not, not joy. She has to have a full seven or eight hours. So we made the move here. I ended up with the amateur athletic union, the AU. And for many in our community, they may not remember that the AAU was located out off of West 86th Street. And I do believe it might be an office depot or a Staples that now sits on the property that was the national headquarters. And so I had the opportunity there to, to administer all of the 
national championships for the team sports, including boys basketball. So I presided over the championship. I got to see Jermaine O'Neal as a high school player. Wow. And I could go down the list of all of the, the uh, greats that have that went on to play in the NBA and all of that great stuff. So uh, that landed me here. I subsequently ended up working at Indiana Black Expo with the late Reverend Charles Williams as the director of family and youth programs. And then on to the NCAA, which uh, when they relocated here, I had the the opportunity to work with them after having administered the National Youth Sports Program in my very first job out of grad school, which was at Wichita State. So the very individuals that I worked with in 1989 and 90 when I was out in Kansas actually walked through the front door at Expo to volunteer when the NCA relocated here. Wow. So it's funny how uh, things connect your experiences. And, you know, there's, what, two degrees of separation, not six degrees. Right. That's mm-hmm. great. What a great uh, set of experiences to lead you to this moment. Mm-hmm. And, you know, here we are in June of 2020. And yes. 2020 uh, is going to be one of these years that gets looked at from lots of different angles, I believe, from for the next 50 years, right? I mean, we remember 1968, and I think, you know, 50 years from now, people will talk about 2020 with COVID-19, pandemic, and now, you know, the tipping point of, just the tipping point of George Floyd's death. And um, so you're, you know, you're in, you know, you've got a huge role to play and you're playing it, but how, how is this changing you know, you're thinking and the Urban League's priorities and programs. I mean, things are moving. Like, it seems like to me, like every three days, we have a whole new world to react to. Yes. And um, so how are, you, how are you guys thinking about the role that you played? I mean, you were very, you know, very good about telling us about all these different things that the sure. Urban League has been doing. What are your thoughts about how that does that change as a the balance change? What are you guys thinking? Well, let me tell you, I think we all had to adjust with uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. I know for us here locally, we were trying to figure out how we were going to quickly transition to a remote operation because, you know, a lot of nonprofits, you know, are we do not necessarily have all the resources to outfit a staff the way we need to. So we had to buy all brand new laptops because we had a hodgepodge of donated equipment uh, with, uh, you know, we didn't have matching software packages, operating systems. And so we had to stand up our operation to be able to function remotely. Uh, but then two days before we were going to transition, I got a call from several senior living communities that said, look, we're worried about how we're going to eat. And so I made calls to gleaners, second helpings and others and uh, to try to make sure that the issue was on their radar and uh, got those senior living communities partnering with with those entities to deal with food food access, if you will. And the next thing I know, I'm getting calls from the community at large. And so we cl- quickly had to take on the role of being one of those organizations that in a very visible way would do food distribution. And so for the past eight weeks, we have been doing drive-through food distributions at the Urban League. That's not normally a space that we operate in, uh, where we're providing uh, food boxes, meal supplies. Uh, We even partnered last week with Samaritan's Feet to distribute shoes to to kids and adults and families. We've done gift cards, everything, because we recognize that with essentially over, what, 600,000 Hoosiers filing for unemployment, at least 100,000 or so in the Indianapolis area, that people are without jobs, without income. And, you know, we we can all become quite jaded and take something as simple as having dinner for granted. And and so we've taken on a major role. And I can tell you that uh, we probably have distributed meals and supplies to nearly 15,000 families now. And that includes an awful lot of children uh, along the way uh, with other COVID relief efforts. We've paid a lot of rent, mortgages, utilities, cable bills, car payments, things that are allowing families to at least sustain themselves during this challenging period. Uh, We've it's a role we take on because that's in some ways, it's just an extension of what we were always doing. We just weren't doing food, if you will. <laughs> we were doing the other things. 
uh, through our through our work with our Center for Working Families. Now, with respect to um, the protests that that we are seeing, not just here in Indianapolis but across the nation, well, you know, the the Urban League has had a long history, and throughout its history, has advocated for everything from civil rights and racial justice to civic engagement and leadership empowerment and all these things that we see happening right now. We look out and we see, we see our younger, our younger leaders across this community and across the, uh, and across the nation, if you will, you know, in a multiracial gathering, if you will, in, in this fight for, for civil rights and police reform. Um, But at the urban league, my initial introduction to the Urban League was through the Young Professionals Group. At that time, I was the executive director of the Circle City Classic, and uh, Joe Slash was, was what, what I would refer to as one of my nine bosses at Circle City Classic. And he says, Tony, I want you to come to this meeting at the Urban League where I'm going to be talking about this, this new concept the, the National Urban League wants to roll out, and it was the Young Professionals. Uh, this was probably a couple of weeks before classic and I was exhausted and I dozed off in the meeting and woke up and they were having an election and they said, well, you know, Tony, you probably should be the first president since more people know you than know the rest of us. And so I was one of the founding members and the first president of the very first young professionals in it. And it's so fitting now that Adrian slash Joe's daughter would be the leader of leader of that group. And she's worked hard. To, to develop a broad engagement across this community so that participants in the exchange at the Urban League are not just black, it's white, it's, it's, it's Latinos, you name it. And they're doing everything from servant leadership, training, to just, just getting involved in the community. And as I've shared with them, all I care about is that you know, you not only serve the Urban League, but you serve all sorts of causes and organizations that are working hard to make a difference across Indy. And so uh, for us, it's, it's continuing to lean in. And, and, and in my role in particular, the uh, past couple of weeks, I've had to, to convene and facilitate a number of, I think, very, very important meetings where we're trying to make sure that people remain focused on not just the need for police reform and accountability, but also for all of us to lean in on all of the root cause systemic issues that essentially have created these, these two existences for our city, these two realities where the data tells us we, the African American community here, 28% of the population is poor. United way data tells us that nearly 40% of families in Indianapolis and central Indiana are either poor or working poor. We know the Brookings Institute data tells us we got a lot of work to do around jobs with good wages and making sure that, that those trickle down throughout the community. And so a lot of what we see, we see peaceful protesters, they're very diverse and they're doing just that. They're being peaceful in protest. Now, are there individuals out there that are using this as an occasion to to undermine what is a what is a good agenda, if you will? Absolutely. And so when we think about the damage, the looting and things of that nature, I think we have to be careful to stay focused on the challenges that we know that are very real in this community that require a lot of time and tension and work. Because we got too many people, we have too many people in our city um, that are that are struggling. I want to uh, I want to kind of um, before I go to a kind of a broader question around you know is this an opportunity in your mind for accelerated positive change because people so I do want to go there but yes I do really want to focus on you know the young professionals so yes it's it's called the the exchange the, the exchange and what is the age group uh, of the exchange um 21 to 40 okay 21 to the age of 40 and and we're big fans of Adrian slash oh we are yes we are we are big I worked with her at state party she or has her uh mm-hmm. Father is a pioneer, an amazing man, and yes, didn't mean to interrupt you, but uh, we're we we are big fans of Adrian and the work she's trying to do. She mm-hmm. is she is magnificent. 
Well, Joe is uh, a mentor to me and is on our uh, advisory committee for our, our race and equity work at CICF. And then Adrian is, uh, I'm taking credit for both of them at this point. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> How, ru- how rude is that? Uh, but I'm just throwing their names around for my own cred. Um, but uh, we had a uh, we have uh, ten Indianapolis Foundation fellows from our hundredth anniversary in uh, 2016, and Adrian is one of our fellows, and yeah. so she represents. It doesn't really represent us. We just we helped we helped give her resources to play a huge role as an important Visit Indy board member. And yes. uh, as one of our young professionals that we wanted to hold up mm-hmm. uh, and help support on major boards around the community. So yeah, we love the Slash family for sure. Yes. Um, so younger people are playing, as you said, playing a huge role in your organization, but also in these protests. Yes. Um, what do you think Indianapolis should do to engage more young people at the tables and seats of power. What do you, I mean, do you have a vision for, I mean, you guys are doing a great job of that, but what could we do as a community, Indianapolis, Central Indiana, to put more 20-somethings and 30-somethings in real positions of power? How, do you have some thoughts about how that could, what that could look like? Yes, absolutely. Um, I have to tell you, I think that now more than ever, we have to be genuine and authentic in our willingness to embrace them and their voices at our respective tables. And we have to do that knowing that uh, when they come through our doors, you know, they're not necessarily coming through our doors to agree with everything we say or to do things as we would probably uh, how we would approach them, if you will. Uh, but everyone has has a role to play, and I think for us, it's it's not just attracting millennials and or younger generations, but understanding that um, Adrian Slash and and many of the young professionals that are involved in the exchange only represent perhaps what might be considered a a professional and or middle class subset, if you will. Part of what we're hearing in terms of criticism is the desire that that millennials and, and younger leaders in the community from all walks, so not just grass tops, but grassroots would be involved and be at the table as well. Uh, because now more than ever, you know, they've they've got a story to tell as well. And much of the anger and frustration that we see rooted in what what is transpiring here and in cities all across America is the fact that, you know, we do have we do have this underclass, if you will. We've got neighborhoods. We've got situations that have been void of investment for years. And while we're in a lot of rooms talking about inclusive economics and all of the things that need to happen, they very much now need to be a part of those discussions so that we really truly understand. So interestingly enough, over the past two weeks, and in particular last week, I have been a part of trying to make sure that other young leaders in this community, such as D. Ross, with the D. Ross Foundation, James Wilson with Circle Up Indy, uh, representatives from uh, Indy 10 Black Lives Matters, and others are part of discussions uh, with with the Race and Cultural Relations Leadership Network. And then there are going to be some this week with corporate leaders, as well as representatives and individuals that are associated with the United Way of Central Indiana. Uh, because, again, we we all have good intentions. But imagine if you were never at the table for any of these conversations or discussions. And, and so you imagine how that lands. And, and what I'm learning through this process is that we have some amazing young leaders that have never really had uh, the opportunity to be at the table. And uh, they may have the idea or the solution that may make sense in many cases. And sometimes it may not be what we think it is. So. I think we have the opportunity to to be open to that, whether it's through the work of of CICF, whether it's the Greater Indianapolis Progress Committee and the Race and Cultural Relations and Leadership Network, the Urban League, and all of the other organizations and or institutions out there that are trying to do a lot of work, a lot of heavy lifting to help people. Would you 
Um, I mean, do you think other not for profits? I mean, you're so you're spending a lot of time as a not for profit, as a leader of a not for profit, focusing on this. I mean, do you think every not for profit should, at this moment in time, should be reevaluating how it might engage, uh, you, you know, people in their twenties, thirties, and you know, a lot of times, right? I mean, a lot of times, yes, organizations have had young professional organizations. Mm-hmm. Which you know might in some way considered a training ground or an engagement strategy, mm-hmm. but uh, is it time to put more a young twenty somethings and thirty somethings on on the on the real board as opposed to the you know the young professionals board or you know what do you think about that? Yeah, I absolutely think it is time for that, um, and not just with nonprofits because I've heard heard several conversations over the past couple of days about issues in the nonprofit sector. Um, the real challenge ultimately is long-term sustained investment in all of these areas that need attention, whether it be under underfunded or under-resourced schools, a lack of affordable housing, livable wages, whether it's it's access to to free training for jobs and the things that we know that are coming. And I know there are bits and pieces of this that are happening, whether it be by the city, the state. Or, or others, but the resources need to be there because there's nothing like having empty conversations, if you will, where we can have great initiatives and we can stand in front of the whiteboard and and talk about what our aspirations are. Uh, but if it's not coupled with with deep investment, then then it becomes discouraging not only for you know, the nonprofits, but the volunteers or anyone that's sitting at that table. And I've been a part of those conversations. Um, I've been a part of the ones where there's committed investment, whether it's our major sporting events and you know, that dollars are going to be there. And then I've also been a part of discussions that involve nonprofit um, efforts where, okay, we're going to figure this out. How many of you can reorient portions of your budgets to accommodate these goals? Well, if I'm the presidency of the Urban League and I am, that becomes a real challenge for me because I might be struggling to meet payroll. And now you're asking me to reorient my budget to help, you know, help with an aspect of a project that may not have been a part of the budget to begin with. So I like the fact that that everyone's leaning in. We've got corporate leaders that are leaning in and they want to hear from our young leaders as well as leaders from the nonprofit sector. So I think it's a good thing. And if it took a lot of circumstances to, to bring us here today, then then maybe we'll be better for it when we come through this moment in time. Uh, but I just urge people to remember that, uh, you know, while we, we've all watched in angst and, and in sorrow uh, the, the murder of George Floyd, we're really talking about 400 years of bigotry, oppression, systemic racism, and it's all it's it's been all brought to bear in this this particular moment, you know. So we 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 saw that and we felt it in the nineteen in the nineteen fifties, sixties, and seventies, and I think we're seeing this again. You know, and people forget that that during the civil rights era, there were young people at sit-ins and at counters that were leading protests and demonstrations. You know, if anyone's symbolic of that is representative John Lewis, Hmm. you know, so we, we still have work to do and, and, and we can, we just have to be really committed now because we've got younger generations that will not accept incremental change. They want substantial change. I've heard a lot of people, um, and and this is a generalization that I I think I buy into as well, but it's more anecdotal about, you know, that millennials maybe are more, uh, you know, more natural, I don't know naturally is the right word, but they're more multicultural in their um, outlook and anti-racist in their outlook than maybe other generations that still exist. Uh, do, you, do you think that's true? I mean, if, if you look at, you know, a white young, you know, white 20 somethings and 30 somethings. Do you, do you have a sense that maybe that, uh, generation 
is more uh, anti-racist and and uh, more respectful of people of color and work you know and, and more committed to social justice or than any you know than generations before or is it just that they're young and idealistic and we haven't uh, ruined them yet I mean how, what's your perspective of, uh, of the younger generation a lot of people think that you know, there's great hope with them I want to believe that I have a tendency to believe it but I'd love for you to weigh in on that sure I I want to be hopeful because when I see the protesters and I see the diversity there and on Saturday at, on the uh, state house lawn uh, there were arguably more white people there than black people. But I'm also reminded of what I saw in Charlottesville when I saw the young white men in their khakis that were marching and were shouting their racial epithets and their anti-Semitic remarks. And so I know that um, that's not the case everywhere. But, you know, we have reason to be hopeful based on what we're seeing because I see volunteers and protesters, people that are that are coming down, providing meals and supporting the protesters and their efforts. I'm witness to to white protesters being told, you know, part of your role here is to stand in between the police officers and the black people. Because they're less likely to assault you or to do something to you than they would a black person. And so I'm getting to witness and see a, a lot of these things. So, you know, I want to be hopeful. And, and I think it's going to take all of us being just that. I don't think we can afford to not be hopeful. I don't think we can afford to sit still and not do anything. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise. And sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel, Grand Hall, and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Thank you for joining us on the podcast. Our guest is Tony Mason, President and CEO, Urban League of Indianapolis. Our co-host is Brian Payne, CEO and President of the Central Indiana Community Foundation. Thank you, Brian, for that quick intro and all the great questions. Oh, thanks. Appreciate it. Let me ask you, Tony, quickly, is there a Hoosier leader or legend you particularly admire? Oh, wow. There's, there's a few. There's a few. Um, I had the good fortune in my career of being able to count the late Reverend Charles Williams as a mentor, the late Bill Mays as a mentor. Of course, George, I'm sorry, Joe Slash, George Pillow. Um, I could go down the list of individuals that, you know, I've had the pleasure and privilege of working with and, and working for. Um, Allison Melanchthon out at the Motor Speedway and Mark Miles. Um, I've learned so much from each and every one of them. And there are others that I could name, of course. Um, but the fact that uh, they were willing to embrace me in different roles and pour into me, uh, they're part of the reason why I am who I am today. The late Bill Crawford as well. Uh, just uh, individuals that were committed to uh, making sure that that the community uh, could potentially be the best version of itself and and to make a difference in the lives for so many. Charles Williams is one of the greatest problem solvers I ever witnessed. <laughs> it's amazing how he could make people happy, yes. solve problems on a, both a small and I didn't know him well, but just on a yes. tactical and strategic level. He he solved problems yes. and did it with a smile. And people would walk away going, okay, I get it. That makes sense. Yes. One of the things that you were heavily involved in was the Super Bowl yes. project. Mm -hmm. And it was probably the greatest coming together in the history of this city, for sure. Something that, you know, I've asked whether it was Ted Bohm or Jim Morris or, you know, other people like, if I had told, you know, they were talking about some meeting in 1979 or 1980, you know, or Joe Slash or David Frick, where I'm like, if I had told you in 2012, Indianapolis would completely redefine the Super Bowl 
for the entire league and the entire country, you would have said, and they all go, no, no chance, like not Indianapolis. But one of the things that Indianapolis did, which I believe was the first time it had been done, was the concept of a legacy project. Mm -hmm. And the legacy project ended up being over by tech. Yes. um, Which is not as great a IPS high school as Howe, which is where I went, but it's pretty darn close. (laughs) And so talk a little bit about the legacy project. Sure. Why that was important, the impact has and then I want to quickly kind of bring in the sub the general subject of education yes. as impactful both now and as part of the greater conversation and the greater push for good that we're all looking for. Yes. Well, you know, a little bit about the the legacy project. And I have to to tell you when Allison asked me to come aboard to be a part of the team and uh, when she mentioned le- the legacy project Um, You know, for me in my mind at that moment, I was just excited about the opportunity, Uh, the idea that you would undertake a legacy project that would help to energize the neighborhood quality of life plan for an entire area of our community and how we would ultimately leverage a one million dollar matching grant from the the NFL that would lead to over $150 million in investment with everything from revitalized new homes to infrastructure, streetscape work, to a number of amenities in that, that now exist in that neighborhood that were not there prior to that time. And again, I want to be careful to say the legacy project for the Super Bowl, it, it came alongside the work that that neighborhood was attempting to do. And I think we got to see what could be accomplished when um, larger, broader community leaders would engage at a neighborhood based level, but help drive a plan developed by the neighborhood. So amazing leaders on the Near East Side, like James Taylor at the Bonner Center and the great work that they have historically done on the Near East Side. But just the, the, the leadership that he provided. And, and now when you drive down East 10th Street, um, you, you see the change in a very big and visible sort of way. And yes, they still have a lot of work to do. But I think that's typically the case when you start talking about the revitalization efforts of an entire neighborhood and knowing that there were a lot of obstacles and hurdles to overcome a lot of naysayers. Uh, Right now, I still, sadly, I encounter people that think that nothing ever happened on the Near East Side. And so, well, you know, you need to go go take a look, um, you know, go over to Tech's campus and to visit the uh, Chase Near East Side Legacy Center, uh, which obviously turned out to be an amazing blessing, not only for Tech High School, but the entire neighborhood. And uh, and just know that when we look back, we'll say that for, you know, that. That neighborhood, the Super Bowl, was a sea change moment. You know, now how we make sure that people can continue to live there and age in place, um, we, we know that those are different challenges that will have to be addressed and dealt with. But there's something to be learned from that effort on the Near East side of what can happen when you have public, private, and nonprofit partnerships all working together to advance a quality of life plan. It was an amazing, amazing experience. And I learned a lot from that experience that somewhat helped me in this role and then developing the relationships with the James Taylors and others who, who run community centers, which a lot of the work that we do somewhat mirrors what they do as well beyond our advocacy work. Shepherd Community Center is another one. We yes. In the old Sahara Grotto. Mm-hmm. We went to a wedding or two there in the 70s, but what's happening at the mm-hmm. Shepherd Community Center right off uh, Washington, East Washington Street yeah. is just terrific. Yeah. Um, part of your career, your personal history, just from, I'm lucky enough to have known you for several years now, yes. uh, and then reading through your biography, you have two college degrees. How many yes. does your wife have? Um, she has two. Microbiology? Yes, microbiology, microbiology from Miami of Ohio, and then pharmaceutical sciences from Butler University. She's also a black belt in Six, six Sigma. Sigma black belt. 
She's really smart. Well, I'm just getting ready to say, well, the, the, I, actually, the whole point of that was to lead up to the fact that you probably don't win any arguments at home. No, I don't win any at home. <laughs> I don't. I don't. But clearly, education has made a difference in your life. Yes. As it has with mine and with, with everybody who pursues that. Yes. And a lot of us do it, quite frankly, because we don't have any other way. Yes. This is my chance. For me personally, my only chance growing up on the east side was join the military, afford college, get some degrees, and and work your tail off and be loyal, and hopefully good things will happen. Yes. You have done so much for education in this city, not just the Urban League. Mm -hmm. Tony Mason has. When you look at something like the Circle Center Classic, do you think it gets shortchanged because there's a lot of focus on the game, but not enough focus on the legacy of the classic itself? Talk a little bit about the educational legacy of the Circle Center Classic effort. Mm-hmm. So with Circle City Classic, you know, people have to go back, I guess, in time to to remember that the late Reverend Charles Williams was the visionary founder of that effort. But a key part of the partnership that existed in the community involved a partnership with the Indianapolis Black Alumni Council. And so each year, IBAC hosts its annual Black College Fair. And historically, what has transpired is nearly 60 to 70 historical Black colleges and universities, HBCUs, would attend. And on that evening, typically Thursday evening before Circle City Classic, They would have representatives on hand. And I cannot recall a year during my tenure where less than $2 million in scholarships were awarded on that evening. So imagine a student coming to something that arguably maybe their parents dragged them to it (laughs) and make sure you've got your transcripts with you. And here's an admissions director telling you on the spot, you're admitted. We're going to give you a full scholarship for four years. Imagine what that meant for so many young people in this community, some whom are probably community leaders right now because of that experience. And so you're talking about millions of dollars alone through the Indianapolis Black Alumni Council. Uh, You're also talking about the dollars that then from Classic went into Indiana Black Expo and Circle City Classic to award not only to students in Indianapolis, but as you know, Indiana Black Expo has uh, 12 or 13 chapter cities across the state. So those resources were also reaching students all across the state of Indiana, making it possible uh, for them to go to colleges. And so while the game certainly got its lion's share of the attention in most years, uh, we know that ultimately it was, as, as you like to say, a, a party with a purpose. Mm. Uh, we also for years partnered with Tom Joyner and the things that he was doing to promote education and particularly to support historical black colleges and universities. And so I know through the classic, we had an amazing impact on young people. Education was important to me in part because and and Brian may know a little bit about this. And my mother had my older brother when she was 14. She did not earn her GED until she got into her 50s. She put my brother through Yale undergraduate and Case Western Law. Mm. She obviously put me through Miami of Ohio where I got both of my degrees. Now, I might have gotten the short end of that deal based on those schools, but I love my alma mater <laughs> and I love my brother as well. Um, but she taught us the importance of education that that a would be something no one could ever take away from you and that b it might position you for opportunities and so i would say for people out there right now that tend to sometimes you hear messages that are devaluing the importance of education and particularly post secondary education uh, i wish we would stop that uh because we don't know which young person will buy into that message that could have become a future mayor, a future business owner, a future urban league president. Education is crucial. And I think if we're all being honest with ourselves, 
we're not going to hire someone that either doesn't have the education, training, or some specialized expertise that says they can be an asset to my organization or my company. You know, my son, who's, I have a son who's going to be 31 in a couple Mm -hmm. months. Mm -hmm. And he came out of high school and he just didn't want to go to college. College to him was Shakespeare and chemistry and that sort of stuff. He just didn't want any part of it. Yes. So he joined the military and he ended up doing, serving two tours in Afghanistan. Came back and his wife, they had twin girls, which I'll happily show you a picture of. All right. And that was his contribution, not only to the country, but to society. Mm -hmm. The military, to me, is the greatest opportunity for anyone. Mm -hmm. I used to go on the Amos Brown show quite a bit. Then it was always somewhat fun and always feisty, always (laughs) feisty. But but I had a great friendship with him, and I miss him. Same here. I miss him, too. And the one thing, you know, we would fuss about whatever we were, I was brought on to fuss about. Yes. But the point I always made and will make to the day I die is that the African-American community in this country is among, if not the greatest example of patriotism and service that you will find in America. When you talk about preparing to lead. Where do you think serving in the military fits in that puzzle? Serving in the military fits into that puzzle for for some, perhaps maybe not for all, because we know that for many African Americans or, or, or blacks across the country, the military may be their only option, depending on on their family situation and their finances. And so going to the military, learning how to lead, learning how to serve, uh, learning or developing a skill and getting training that when they come back to their 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 communities, that would position them for job opportunities and the opportunity to 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 make a decent living and to take care of their families is important. And so I don't think anyone should rule out participation in the military. And you're absolutely right. Um when you talk about blacks in the military, because we know that for many, uh, when they returned from their tours of duty, uh, they were not always received at all. Or Mike Lee has well. a new documentary about that right now. And, and yet many of them entered the military knowing that when they came back, things might not be different here in America. And so that takes an awful lot of, of, of commitment and we have to acknowledge we, we've come a long way yet. We know we, we still obviously have a lot of work to do, but uh, I encourage our young people to consider whether it's post-secondary college training, military, but do something, do something that prepares you for the future. Um, because again, right, right now we, we're, we're living in an economy and in a society where I do believe I saw a statistic that said here very soon at what, at least 60 percent of the jobs are going to require some level of post-secondary education and training. The number might actually be higher. Um, but but just graduating from high school is is not enough now. Employ, enroll, enlist. That's right. That's the that's the phrase that's being used that I think it hits it right on the money. Uh, one more quick question before I turn it back over to Brian to kind of pull everything together. Sure. Uh, actually had in my notes before we came here about young people. Yes. Any history of the civil rights movement, the modern civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s, mm-hmm. it's it's the it's the young people you see and and it's a bottom-up revolution. Any history of it'll show it's a bottom-up mm-hmm. revolution. I mean it's hard to believe that Martin Luther King wasn't even 40 when he was assassinated. Right. Most people think he's a lot older, but he wasn't 40 yet. And he had been on the national scene for a long time. Ralph Abernathy and the list goes on and on. But the young people in the colleges, whether it's anti-Vietnam, pro-civil rights. Mm -hmm. A, do you see that happening again today? I think you said you did, but I just want to make sure that that I heard you correctly, that it's the younger people who are saying, we're going to get the ball rolling. Much like, quite frankly, the modern LGBT movement is younger people. The younger generation going, 
well, I don't know what you really felt about in the 60s and 70s, but this is the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And how important is it for people like me? It's it's hard to think that that I'm older because I'm so used to being younger. (laughs) But for people who grew up a little bit earlier to allow those young people to have their say. Mm-hmm. Well, it's crucial that we allow them to have their say, just as uh, the three of us that are participating in this interview, at some point in time, someone allowed us to be at the table and, and to have our say. Um, you're right. It It is a bottom-up driven revolution, if you will, that we see happening before our very eyes. And we have to be cognizant of the fact that when we talk about or we reflect on the civil rights era, if you will, and we talk about the incremental gains and the progress. Well, if you are a young person who all you've known is poverty and struggle, uh, maybe you have had to deal with family members being incarcerated. Maybe you have had negative encounters with law enforcement. Talking to them about incremental gains and progress from the civil rights era falls on deaf ears. They, they can't relate or connect to that. All they know is their existence today. And so that's why it's so important that we, we hear them, we allow them a seat at the table, and we also play a, a part in sharing uh, important lessons as well because I'm a father of, of two young African-American men. I have a 25-year-old son and I have a 22-year-old son. Um, Our 25 year old is really leaning into this because for him, this is his civil rights moment. Um, We talk a lot. He's good about studying. Um, So he knows that there's so much he didn't learn in school that wasn't taught to him in his history classes. And so with that comes frustration maybe even anger at times. I didn't know this. Why were we not taught this? Um, So yeah, we got to, we got to embrace them. We got to embrace their energy. We got to try to understand their approach just as we hope that they will try to understand and embrace, um, embrace us as we try to, to share uh, what the possibilities are and that we can perhaps give them hope because a lot of what we see right now is hopelessness that has transitioned to outrage. So we're in a moment where there's a lot of white people in power. Yes. Who seemingly now is the moment that they're like, oh, I get it. Oh, I have a deeper understanding about what the black experience has been I'm sorry that I didn't know it before, Yes, but I'm getting it now. Mm -hmm. In all walks of our leadership profession, from sports to corporations to government to not-for-profit and philanthropy, there's a lot of moment right now, there's been a moment of, oh, like the light bulb has finally gone on in the heads and hearts of white people in power. Yes. How hopeful are you that that is not just a momentary um, enlightenment and that that can be leverage for real progress and real change? Are you are you feeling hopeful in this moment? Yeah, I am. I am cautiously hopeful because of conversations that I've been in the past week, week and a half. Um, I don't think we can afford to not lean in, be honest, be genuine and uh, and attempted we've got to address the ills that face our community the challenges that that struggling black families struggling families of color are dealing with uh, we have to deal with police reform and accountability um, if we do not i think people lose sight uh, of history where as things transition we think about ferguson most people when they look back on that and they well, you know, they protested for about a week and then it was no longer on the news. That's not the case. They protested for over a year, whether it was big or small, might not have gotten media coverage. 
our young people are, and they, they, they've raised their voices loud enough for us to understand that they're serious about the need for major change and major change right now. And, and it's a fair position for them to have because, again, we have all of the data. We have all of the statistics. We don't need another study to know that our schools are struggling, that people are poor, people don't make livable wages. We know this. So now it, it's about what are we really committed to doing? And so, so for corporate heads, it's, you know, commit, you know, commit to livable wages, commit to looking at how you, how you deal with your hiring practices, your, and who gets promotions and, and things of that nature, commit to doing better with your supply chain and, and how you engage minority and women owned businesses. There are a lot of things that we already know what we need to do. We just have to be committed to doing them. And I think an important part of this is very much with the work that you're doing, Brian, with, with CICF and the mission change and focus. It's okay for white people to lean in and do the work. It's not just cut Tony Mason or cut a grassroots organization a check. No, lean in and see the work through its fruition. Show that there's a commitment to long-term investment in sustainability. Because I have been in those conversations Well, well, you know, it just seems a little bit awkward for me to be a part of it or to lean. No, lean in. And, and, and I do say this. I said, lean in just like Brian. <laughs> But it's going to take it's going to take all of us. It really is. And it's not a moment where you just write a check and walk away. It's it's long term strategic planning, long term investment, because, again, this is we're talking about a third of the community. If we're talking about the black community. But if you're looking at poverty as a whole, we're not just talking about the African-American community. The challenges facing the African-American community, the same ones facing the, the Latino community. It's facing poor whites, which oftentimes get lost in this conversation. Um, and, and sometimes I wish, you know, they had a louder voice as well. Uh, but all too often groups get pitted against one another. And uh, that's especially a, when resources are especially when it comes to resources. Yes. Um, I have one more question. Um, sure. So uh, I'm very fortunate that I'm surrounded at CICF by really brilliant people of color. Yes. And they tell me all the time and um, that, you know what, a lot of these, you know, these racist systems that we have in this country have been created over time by powerful white people. Yes. And if we're going to undo them or disrupt them or replace them, um, we need white people to lean in, like you said, I mean, yes. you know, not just white people, that's right. every people, all yeah, people, that's right. But, but it cannot be done without powerful white people. That's right. And you, it seems like you agree with that assessment. One, 100%. We, we see young white people playing a major role in protests and demonstrations all across the country. And just as that's playing itself out at protest sites, we need the same thing to happen in the boardrooms all across, not just our city, but across the country as well. Class white rooms. people leaning in classrooms as well. Marion University is leading the way. I mean, they're a client, mm -hmm. so I should disclose that, but they are they are <laughs> well, they are. So it's not contrived. They're right. they're pushed for to recruit more minority, especially minority males, into their teaching program and put them in positions of leadership yes. in the classroom and in the schools and in the districts mm -hmm. is unparalleled. Yes. And see, an education is a great example because you know, for the past, what, 10 or 15 years, the fight has been about traditional public schools versus charters. Well, they're all struggling. And poor kids attend traditional public schools. They're in charter schools. They're in private schools. Education is still arguably the number one civil rights issue. And so what are we going to do about that as opposed to siphoning resources off of one set of schools to support another? Our kids are in bad schools that are that are struggling and, and many are struggling in part because they are under resourced. It's no longer OK to say, well, resources and money are are, are not the problem. I only hear that. 
when it comes to things that impact people of color. I don't hear that in other spaces. So if we're committed to this city and where we need our city to go, because it's our city and these are our people, we have to embrace and own all of it. If we're committed to going forward, then, then we need to do just that on a number of different fronts and, and not just education. Um, because if we don't, I mean, what what is Indiana without Indianapolis? Well, Tony, thank you for, thank you. Uh, again, at an incredibly busy time in your leadership, making uh, the time and space for this conversation with Robert and myself. And uh, one of the things that we've become aware of at CICF is that, you know, we need to play a, you know, whatever role we can to making sure that there's more equity and power, Yes, that we need more people of color in power. And you do an awesome job of, uh, of representing how powerful it is to have a black man play a, the kind of role that you're playing. And we need to help create a community where more black men and black women and Latinx men and Latinx women uh, and, you know, and every other hue and uh, along the gender uh, rainbow have power because everyone, in our opinion, everyone has superpowers. Yes. And how do we become the community that, that really creates an opportunity for everyone to live out their superpowers? So thanks for your leadership. Thank you. And thank you for having me. You not off the hook. You got five questions. You ready? Okay. What was your first job? My first job was at Wichita State University. Well, you know what? Now, are you talking about before? Your first job. First job. Okay. My first job was as a recreational sports uh, programmer, youth programmer, if you will, in Evanston, Illinois, at Robert Crown Community Center. What was your first concert? My first concert was... A rap concert, it was held at the UIC Pavilion downtown Chicago. It had Run DMC, the Fat Boys, who else? I mean, it was a whole Houdini. bunch of Houdini might have been a part Flash. of it, but, but I remember, I remember those. This is my era. Two. This is, you know, Gen yes. X, right? Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you could suggest any book for someone to read, which book would you recommend? White Fragility. By um, oh, no. Robin D'Angelo. Robin D'Angelo. I think it's it's a must read now for everyone. If you could witness any event in history, be there in person as it happens, which event would you choose? Past event. Any event in history. Oh, any event in history. Let me come back to that one. <laughs> Number five, if you could have dinner with anyone living today, two hours off the record, whom would you choose? Two hours off the record, whom would I choose? I would choose Barack Obama. He has been a very popular choice, along with George W. Bush, actually, has been a very popular choice. Mm -hmm. Witness any event in history that I would have been in Grant Park the night that Barack Obama got elected president. You have been listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmond Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel, Grand Hall, and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the law firm of Bose, McKinney, and Evans, and the Bose Public Affairs Group, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Thank you for joining us on the podcast. Co-host has been Brian Payne of the Cent Central Indiana Community Foundation, president and CEO, and our guest has been a true leader. And I mean that sincerely. I'm lucky enough to have known you for several years and I've had many conversations. I've seen your work. Thank Tony you. Mason, president and CEO of Indianapolis Urban League. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. Dot com.